just our first crossover to our friends at CERN, I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown about what's going to happen here. So we're going to be doing this special live event for the first two hours of the spacewalk, and then we're going to be switching to the NASA coverage of the spacewalk and coming back at different vital points to give you updates. Um, and so, as we've got some experts here today, please do make the most of their expertise. We want you to submit your questions. If you're following us on social media, please use the hashtag Spacewalk for AMS. That's Spacewalk for AMS, and we'll be capturing those questions and at different times throughout the program, we'll be posing them either to our experts, experts here or to the team at CERN. Okay, so I've just been advised that we're ready to go over to CERN, so we'll switch to them and we'll get a bit of a peek behind the scenes of the AMS uh, Payload Control Center. So we'll go there now. Welcome to CERN, welcome to the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer Payload and Operations Control Center. This is a very special and unique building at CERN because we don't have many payloads and actually the payload is on the International Space Station. Uh, this is the IMS headquarters here at CERN and we will discover in a moment what they do inside the building always and also during the extravehicular activity to service the IMS. Down there you can see a structure that gives you an idea of how big is AMS. That metallic structure was used to transport AMS uh, from CERN, once it was assembled and tested here, to ESTEC, uh, Nordvik, to the ESA Center for Qualification to Space Flight. There are also other memorabilia. Those trees that you see there are not just any trees. Those trees, uh, one of them was planted by the seven astronauts of the STS-134. One of them was Roberto Vittori of, of the European Space Agency. These are the astronauts who took AMS in May 2011 to the space station with Space Shuttle Endeavour. And that was a really memorable adventure. So we planted this tree in that memory. There is also a plague on the ground. And the other tree was planted by NASA Administrator Charles Bolden. This is just to show how international is this experiment, not only among physicists from many institutes all over the world, but also with space stations, like with space agencies like NASA and ESA. And we are very glad today to collaborate with ESA uh, during this uh, incredible space walk to service AMS, the one, the first one of, uh, of many. Let's go now inside and meet Mike Capel, who is the staff scientist at AMS, who is going to explain to us what's happening in this building and what's happening during the EVA to service AMS. Let's go in. Hello, Mike. Say hello, Paula. And thank you for your time, uh, a sp very special moment. Uh, there are not uh, every day these EVAs, and I guess for your team and you, uh, it's a very busy time. <laughs> yes, so it's a very busy time, time uh, that we're preparing, preparing for the EVA on the, the spacewalk on the space station. Okay, before talking about that, let's uh, take a look at what we see here uh, in the anteroom to the payload and operations control center. Let's do that. So here we have the um, <coughs> model, here we have the model of the space station. Uh, the space station is 110 meters wide, 80 meters across the solar array, so the size of a football field. It's huge. <laughs> it's huge. It uh, weighs 420 tons. And out on the right arm, they call the starboard arm, is AMS. It, on this model, it looks uh, quite small. But it, it looks tiny. We've, We've seen the, the, the structure, structure that supported it uh, in, uh, in, the in the transport to ESTEC, and, and it gives an idea of how big it is. In fact, it's uh, 5 meters by 4 meters by 3 meters weighed seven and a half tons when we sent it to orbit. Uh, and we were taken up to orbit. Huge payload. <laughs> a huge payload, huge, huge thing. But the space station is big enough to support us, uh, give us power, and uh, collect our data and send it down to the ground. And uh, we can see uh, another model here that is a bit bigger than the one on the model of the space station. Yes, uh, and here you see that this uh, is a, a one-third scale model of the detector. Um, like all the particle detectors at CERN, there are many different layers. Each of the different particles give different signals in each of the different layers. Um, and uh, the key thing about AMS compared to other experiments in space is that we have a magnet, so we can tell positively charged particles from negatively charged particles. And we do that with a magnet around the center and the tracker. 
So the tracker really forms the heart of the spectrometer, the thing that measures the, the particle energy. That's pretty incredible. It's uh, really modeled against experiments that take beams from CERN's accelerators, but this one takes beam from the cosmos, right? <laughs> yes, we just uh, go up to the cosmos to measure. And the, the thing about AMS, people have been trying to measure cosmic rays, measuring cosmic rays for over 100 years now. But all of the experiments have had limitations of either how long they could last in space, the size they could be in space, or they've been in the Earth's atmosphere. And they've had to, anything they, they measured was filtered through the Earth's atmosphere. So the space station is a real unique vantage point for this kind of experiment with a real magnet uh, with in a it. With a real magnet and a, a, a real good sized experiment that we could put up on. Yes. And here on this monitor, you were explaining to me um, sometime when we were preparing this, you can see the crossing of cosmic rays through the, the, the detector itself. Yes. So here we have uh, the view in the, in the direction of the magnetic field. This is the perpendicular view. And uh, you can see as the particles go through here, they'll, the red track uh, has them bending in different directions. And these blue dots are the responses of the different detectors as they go through. Yeah, so this is real, in real time. <laughs> in, well, in fact, we collect about 1,000 particles a second. We measure 1,000 okay. particles a second. And this is one of the interesting uh, particles for each second that we measure. Right, you can visualize some of them <laughs> at the same <laughs> we time. Can't see all so of them. let's go inside. Uh, uh, let's not be uh, too loud because people are working in here 24 hours a day, right? Well, we can't park the space station. We don't have a long shutdown. So, yes, we're right. working in here 365 days a year. <laughs> okay, let's go in. So, there we are inside the payload and operations control center. This is a real control center with many terminals. But the first thing that strikes me is that uh, screen up there, the very big screen, <coughs> yes. with a huge number written on it, and I guess the trajectory of the space station, right? Yes, you can see the space station at the moment is just below uh, South Africa. And the, the, the real advantage of measuring 365 days a year is that you can just keep going and measure a lot of particles. So in the eight and a half years that we've been on the space station, we've measured over 148 billion particles, one after another. That's crazy. Individually, that's uh, that's really incredible. It's uh, it's yeah. a huge statistics. Like every experiment at CERN, we have a huge statistics. And uh, <laughs> what's exceptional for us is that it's a huge statistics for cosmic rays. It's right. orders and orders of magnitude greater than we could ever get for cosmic rays before. And this is allowing us to make a, a lot of new discoveries. Yeah, there are many ways in which IMS is unique. And this one of the most important one, it does unique cosmic ray physics uh, up on the space station. So in addition to seeing the space station at any moment uh, where it is right now on that panel that actually people can also follow on a screen from the ESA outreach pages. I, I used to play with that <laughs> a lot. Uh, we you can also uh, have a direct link somehow to the station itself. Uh, yes, because we're operating AMS on the space station, we're uh, quite closely involved in the space station operations. So in addition to the things we would find in a, in a usual CERN experimental control room, uh, which is at that end of the room, we're uh, monitoring each of these detector layers quite carefully, the tracker, the TRD, and so on. Uh, here we have uh, a set of computers which is looking after the communications back and forth between AMS and the space station. Right. And we have a person who's listening to the communications between... NASA and the station. NASA and the station and within NASA to organize the operation of the station. And by the way, if you are lucky and the Professor Tinga has time, uh, we will have a video connection with him from here uh, just before uh, the spacewalk starts. Let's see if he, if he has time. Yes. But it will be from here, one of the terminals down there. So now let's go back here. We already said that you work uh, 24 hours a day and uh, each of the screens is dedicated to controlling one or the other of uh, the various systems of the, of the detector, right? Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, so and and so and this is much like uh, the other particle detectors at CERN. What's unusual for us is we have this whole side of the room, which is dedicated to the thermal control of the experiment, because the space station is going uh, through 16 orbits a day. Right. The sun comes up 16 times a day, goes down. It gets very hot 16 times a day, and then gets very cold. So we have to be constantly measuring all of the temperatures on the experiment. We have right. about a thousand measurements and make sure that we're staying in our temperature ranges. Right, so temperature is the key word today uh, for uh, these um, upcoming EVAs uh, because it's the thermal control system 
yes. uh, of uh, the tracker that is, is the object of the EVA. Can you tell us more about uh, this uh, operation? Well, so the EVA operation, uh, well, uh, I, yes, I certainly. We can yeah, go okay. to We can go to the model. model. So here, here's a slightly smaller model. So again, here's AMS. Uh, in small? <laughs> in the even smaller, so five <laughs> by, by four by three meters. Um, the astronauts are living and working usually in uh, the center part of the space station inside of these modules. Right. And in fact, we can see the astronauts uh, there today. Right. Uh, preparing for this EVA. Uh, yeah, right so you, you, you know what they're doing right now. Uh, yes, right <laughs> now they're um, practicing the, the maneuvers they will do with the robotic arm. The two astronauts on the left, uh, Jessica and uh, Christina, will be driving the robotic arm while Luca is on the end of it. And yeah. Luca is in a virtual reality headset. Right, we can see he has a headset, right. And uh, so they're practicing, and he will be on the arm here. Uh, well, first he will come out of the airlock with Drew. The airlock's down here. Yeah. Uh, then they will climb up here, get on the arm. Then the arm will sail Luca uh, over until he comes here and can work on the AMS experiment. In the meantime, Drew will be taking tools out. Uh, he'll attach a uh, couple bags of tools here. And while Luca is working here, uh, just like in an operating theater, he will be handing the tool, each tool that Luca needs to, to him and then taking it back when he needs the next one and so on. It's just flabbergasting to think that this is happening while the station is traveling 28,000 kilometers per hour? Yes. And it's just incredible. Yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable what, what they do <laughs> up and there. And, and we'll be uh, tracking it very carefully, everything uh, they're doing while they're outside and working on the side of our experiment. Right, and w how can you do that from here? Well, we'll have the video, we'll have uh, headsets, we'll be listening to all of their conversations uh, uh, between the space and ground and, be and between the astronauts, between the astronauts here and the astronauts driving the robotic arm inside the space station. All those conversations we'll be monitoring. If we have any concerns, we'll discuss them with the people in Houston right. and we'll come up with a problem resolution. We are actually very grateful for you to welcome us here. And I'll come back soon to talk to Dr. Zhang Zhang, who is the lead engineer for the upgrade thermal tracker control system. Okay, so we're starting to gain a picture of just how complex these spacewalks are. And actually, experienced spacewalks as spa spacewalkers as they are, Luca and Drew, they're actually out of the space station and they're on their way, they're starting their spacewalk. So um, I'll just ask the panel here, Frank and Ave maybe, to tell us a little bit about what it is, what stage they're at, what we can see on screen, what's happened to this point. Hello, okay. So, uh, welcome. Actually, the spacewalk started uh, most earlier than, than expected. I mean, the crew was ready before. So, we are already 25, 26 minutes in the spacewalk. Uh, just a big picture what they have done. Luca was uh, getting out of the airlock first. Uh, the first thing that he did was to attach himself with a safety line, the same kind of line that you can see here on the table with these reels and uh, this, uh, this extension here. So, he was dropping a hook like this uh, outside the airlock. Then he attached uh, the hook of uh, Drew, and then he recovered the three bags, uh, the two bags, uh, big bags that uh, Drew had inside, and he stowed them outside of the airlock. Then Drew could get out, and they moved away to the position where the SSRMS arm is uh, located. Uh, and uh, what we have seen uh, recently is that uh, Luca was configuring the APFR, the articulated f uh, portable foot restraint, this is a platform where it will be fixed by the feet uh, on, the, on, on top of the robotic arm. And uh, this will start the sequence of uh, moving in with the arm up to the IMS uh, location where uh, we will have to work there. In the meantime, uh, Drew is uh, moving to the location, uh, translating along the truss of the space station, and is carrying currently the one of the bag that we call the red bag. Uh, of course, both of them have to do a kind of safety tether swap. Uh, so you can imagine that the, the safety line that Luca has uh, pulled uh, up from the, the airlock cannot be attached to the arm itself when he's moving. So he has to drop another uh, safety tether on the uh, uh, extremity of the arm. And uh, Drew, because his safety line is not long enough, as he's going out with two, and he has to drop one on the structure on an unrail and is uh, moving up to the work site. So now uh, 
we see sometimes uh, some videos from uh, from the helmet uh, of uh, Luca and from Drew. Uh, the next step will be uh, the movement of the of the arm to position slowly Luca uh, close to the work site. Thank you, thank you, Eve. Um, so yes, as the next stage might take a little bit of time, as Eve just explained, but it's good to be up to date with where we are at this point. Um, so while we're waiting for the team to get to the work site, uh, we actually have a special message that Luca recorded earlier from the Columbus Lab, telling us a little bit about the spacewalk and what it is that he's going to be doing today. So we will um, go ahead and, and play that one. Hello, I'm European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano from the International Space Station, the Columbus Lab. As an astronaut, donning an EVA suit and stepping out into space can be one of the greatest challenges, and at times it can be quite a rush. My second spacewalk during the mission Volare in 2013 is actually a reminder of how many things can go wrong, and sometimes they do. And it also showed how the training we receive as astronauts and as control center staff gives us the tools we need to handle even the most unexpected and difficult situations. Now, we are gearing up to repair and enhance the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS-02, which is an instrument that was never designed to be repaired in orbit. So this will require intense coordination, concentration, and extremely precise task execution. But we have been preparing for it for a long time, so we feel ready. The first of the AMS spacewalks will set the pace for the rest of the series. We will open up the core of the cooling systems, which will show us how and where to intervene. Several new tools that didn't exist before will be needed for the process, and we spent many months on the ground developing and testing them. It will be one of the most complex CVA operations ever performed. We expect to venture out four, maybe five times, over the course of a month, which is a new endeavor for the ISS program and definitely for a European astronaut. On the station, preparations for a spacewalk begin around two weeks ahead of time with a set of procedures that are called the Road to EVA. And those make up about two or three hours of our schedule every day because we need to service our spacesuits and prepare every item we have to take with us. And this is all on top of all the training carried out ahead of our mission at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston with the Argos system and at the MBL, the Neutral Buoyance Facility. Thank you for tuning in to watch my crewmates and I work up here in space. And thank you also to our teams on the ground for their leadership, training and support. Everything we do is about moving humankind beyond our current limits for the benefits of Earth and space exploration. AMS is hunting for very ancient and mysterious particles as they travel across the universe from the beginning of time. Our journey as humans may not be as long nor mysterious, but it will be nonetheless incredibly interesting. Thank you, Luca. And a team is something that Luca talks about quite a lot, and it's something that's very important. We see two spacewalkers out there today, but they're not the only people involved in this. There, there are huge teams on the ground, and also there are um, astronauts working inside the space station to support them as well. And um, one thing that we touched on earlier is the fact that today uh, Luca is um, EV-1, which is the lead spacewalk role, and it's the first time that a European astronaut has been in this role during a spacewalk. Frank, can you tell me a little bit about what these roles mean? What's EV-1? What are Luca's responsibilities today? Well, the, the EV-1 is, of course, the, the lead spacewalkers. Uh, all the major decisions uh, are, are with the lead uh, spacewalkers. It's also the one that goes first out of the hatch that does all the procedures uh, on the uh, on the hatch opening, on, on getting out of the space station, and also when coming back, he's the last one coming back in and making sure that uh, everything is secured as well. But over and above that, the lead space worker has also a very important role in the preparation and in the training ahead of time, because uh, as Luca explained, this is really a teamwork. On one hand, of course, the, the trainers, the, the, the people on the ground prepare the procedures, 
but then as an astronaut you need to train and then during the training you can see things that work well, things that need to be maybe adapted, that need to be changed, uh, a different sequence that can work better. So the lead space worker has a, a really uh, important role also in the design of the spacewalk itself, in the design of how we are going to about doing this, uh, this repair. And then once of course, uh, once you are uh, on orbit and outside, it's the role of the lead space worker to keep situation awareness. Where are we in the EVA? What are the next uh, things to do? Uh, where is my uh, buddy space worker? Uh, how are we going to, to proceed? So it's a, it's a very important role and uh, we are very proud that uh, Luca indeed uh, can be the first uh, European to have this role. And I'm sure as I, I was the first commander, but now we have seen, we have had Alexander Gerst and Luca now also being the commander of the, of the space station. It's only the first, uh, there will be many to follow, I'm, I'm quite sure. Fantastic. We're definitely looking forward to that and to the rest of the spacewalks in this series. Um, uh, but I know something that you mentioned earlier, Andrea, as well, is that we have a flight surgeon supporting um, in Houston as well today. Can you tell me a little bit more about that supporting role and how else we're supporting? Yeah, so normally we don't have a European flight surgeon on console and ourselves as the ESA BME Eurocom, we're the eyes and the ears of the flight surgeon really paying attention and taking care of uh, the European crew's health. But for uh, special exceptions um, like the spacewalk today, we actually have a European flight surgeon, so the astronaut doctor, and they are on console and they're monitoring live uh, the ECG, so heart rate, as well as the temperature, um, oxygen and carbon dioxide levels, and they are able to have live readings and monitor as the medical specialists um, during the entirety of the spacewalk. Uh, so for example, perhaps if their heart rate is getting too high, you might hear uh, Capcom asking them to just chill out and pause for a couple of minutes. Um, and that'll be, for example, to get their heart rate down. Um, and uh, that's a really exceptional and, uh, and really great um, medical uh, specialty that we're able to provide as the European Space Agency as well with astronaut specialty doctors. Fantastic. Thanks for talking us through that. I've just had word that um, our friends back at CERN are ready for another cross. So we'll cross over to Paula now. And I think they've had some questions and they've got an interview going on there. So over to you, Paula. Nope. I might have lost them. Paula, you're live. A have we got you there? Yes, hello, Eta. Uh, hello, Alison. Uh, welcome to CERN. We are now in the top floor. Just for one period and operations cannot be physicists from AI are on shift right now because they're really focused on the spacewalk. I'm here with three AMS scientists who could uh, come and are not on shift right now. But starting from my left, Alberto Oliva. Hi, Alberto. Hi, everybody. So I'm Alberto Oliva. I come from the Italian Institute of Nuclear Physics, INFM, section of Bologna, and I'm an AMS scientist. And this is Mercedes. Hello, I am Mercedes Panizza, and I work at the University of Geneva as an AMS scientist. And then we have Andre. Yeah, I'm Andre Kuhlman, uh, MIT, uh, senior research scientist at MIT, the deputy of the director for AMS. So we are going to go through the science of AMS later on, and uh, everybody is welcome to ask questions to our three scientists here live on the chat, on Facebook, on all social medias, both of CERN and of ESA. Uh, right now, we want to focus on the star of the spacewalk, which is uh, this, this year, the upgraded thermal pump system of the AMS tracker. This is, of course, a small uh, 3D printed model of it, and this is a small model of the main part of the heart detector. Andre, can you tell us uh, what's going to happen during this? It is a pleasure. Mm -hmm. So here on the right, you can see uh, the mock-up of uh, AMS, which is a very simplified version. You can consist of several detectors, such that its structure is very similar to the structure of big detectors at accelerators like LHC. The heart of the AMS is the magnet. This is a tracker inside. All together we have nine layers, and they are cooled by uh, a thermal system to remove heat from the inside of the magnet. So uh, all together the system, this uh, thermal system, was built with uh, four-fold redundancy, 
uh, meaning that we have four pumps at the moment uh, we are running on the very last pump uh, it's not clear how long will it last therefore we want to place the aging system is the new one UDTS which will be uh, placed on, on the side of the uh, MS on its structure okay so we're gonna discover more about this uh, uh, very soon in a clip the lead engineer of the upgraded thermal tracker pump system but for now I've already got questions from our social media thank you everyone so from Instagram what role is CERN playing in all this? Andre, you are deputy spokesperson of the AMS. Even if you are not concerned, I think you can answer this question. No, CERN is uh, not a member of AMS. It greatly contributed to the success of AMS. First, okay. for the assembly. CERN provided a clean room where the entire detector was assembled. And furthermore, it built this building in which we are now uh, for uh, post AMS talk. Very good. Uh, I have um, two, three more questions before we go on the next clip. Uh, maybe we can share it uh, um, for whoever wants to answer. Maybe Mercedes, yes. If uh, AMS was never intended to be repaired in space, what was the original plan for AMS-02 after the three first years in operation? Uh, the plan was to keep it uh, running as long as we could. Now, since we want to run for the entire time of the space mission, we want to upgrade the system to make sure that we can run until 2028. That's great. And we've discovered right now that uh, there are many physics reasons for continuing operating AMS as long as the space station lives. Uh, Alberto, two more for you. How old is AMS and what is its function? So uh, AMS has been launched in 2011 in May. So this is the length uh, of uh, how much time we spent in orbit. So this is eight years of a continuous, or, or continuous operation. The project in itself is much older. We had all the phase of designing and constructing and the prototype of AMS. In fact, this one is AMS-02, but it was a prototype that flown in 1998, AMS-01. So the story of the project, in fact, is very, very long. And now we are just experience this uh, extremely exciting uh, new phase of the life of AMS. With data. Yes, with many data and uh, hopefully much more data. Okay, let's now focus back on the upgraded thermal tracking pump system uh, with lead engineer, uh, Dr. Zhang Zhang, uh, whom we met yesterday because she's now in the POCC uh, following very closely because the UTP PCS is her baby, actually. So let's take a look at what we discussed yesterday with Zhang Zhang and find out more about uh, this very important component that is being replaced. And we're back in the payload and operation control center of the magnetic spectrometry here at CERN. Dr. Zhang, thank you for being with us. Yes, of course. And thank you for your time. I know this is a very busy time for you because you're the lead engineer of the thermal tracker control system, exactly the object that is going to be served upon mission uh, in a few days. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to start with, uh, tell me what it is, this object, what is a thermal tracking control system, why do you need it, and why it's necessary to have an object like that for uh, a detector in space. Okay, and as you know, the silicon tracker in MS is deeply embedded in the central part of MS. So, when the uh, tracker is working, it generates a lot of heat. Mm -hmm. Since it is uh, in the core of the AMS, there is no way for the heat uh, to dissipate into the deep uh, space by the stream. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, it needs a very delicate cooling system so that it can transmit uh, the heat to the uh, radiator so that it goes to the space, uh, to the space. Okay, so it's really a piece that it wouldn't be necessary here on Earth if the detector was operating here. It's necessary because it's the detector is in space. And you were part of the team that uh, assembled uh, this object and now you, you are doing work from here yes <laughs> yes uh, at that uh, console at the MST, right. so. while the object is in space what, what do you do exactly at your terminal mm. at, during the normal days and the system is designed to be autonomous so whenever the space station and the thermal environment changes the system is able to handle it by itself right. but sometimes we did need to interfere with the system 
uh, if there are some vehicles visiting the space station, or the space station is trying to uh, adjust the solar panels or the radiator positions, and this uh, usually happens in the winter time. Mm -hmm. So at that moment, we need to send a new configuration parameters of the system so that it can still run smoothly to Google Checker. Right. This is usually what we are doing at that console, and this uh, kind of intervention can spread uh, in a month or in a year. Right, so, but um, this is a normal times. So now it's a special time for you and for your colleagues because uh, the astronauts are going to work this system mm -hmm. during uh, uh, one of the extravehicular activities. So there are a few EVAs foreseen. Yes, uh, there are due to the difficulties and uh, accessibility, and there are going to be in total four EVAs. So in this EVA one. Uh, from our side, we, are, we don't have many activities at this moment, but starting from EV2 and onwards, we will have several uh, activities so to working on the uh, UTDPS. So basically, we're going to work from here in tune with the astronauts up there. Yes. Right. So uh, for example, in EV2, the astronaut is going to cut the current uh, cooling system mm -hmm. in order to release all the CO2 inside system and from our side uh, we can read the pressure and temperature directly and yes. provide this feedback to the astronaut so that uh, they can um, either um, take precaution of it or accelerate the procedure right so you're, you're talking through Houston I guess yes okay through the NASA Johnson Space Center yes correctly and then in EV3 yeah so um, the astronaut is going to bring out the UTPS from the space station and you have a little model here. Yeah, this is the little model, and the reality yeah. it is about one meter by 0 0.8 by 0 0.6 uh, meters. Uh, right. So quite huge. And how heavy is it? it? It's about 150 kilo. But in space, it does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. It's a zero exactly. g conditions. Yes. <laughs> That's a real advantage. Yes. <laughs> and then the astronaut is going to bring this UTDPS and uh, install it at this location on the side, on the left side. Yeah, on this seen from here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they are going to cut eight cooling lines in order to by pass the current one behind this debris shield yeah. and make the reconnections at the fluid lines to be connected with the, the new one. Yes. Okay. So the old one is going to stay? Yeah, the old one is going to and stay. And they're just adding an, uh, this new piece. Yes. And um, you showed me just before um, the spare of this piece. You have a spare. Yes. Of, what do you call a, a, a space spare or a flight spare? Yes, so right. flat spare. So this is in the, in a lab just opposite here. We're gonna take a look at that. I'm going to open this uh, climb a chamber. Right now we have the UTPS flat spare located inside, and right now you can see the temperature is around 20 degrees. So there won't be any condensation in the chamber. So it's safe to open the chamber. So this is the actual flat spare. And uh, you can see it's uh, covered by the aluminum plate uh, for four sides. But here you can see this is the handrail uh, in space. It's a uh, aiding hand for the astronaut to grab so that they can move around the, around the UTTPS. And on the other side, you can see these are the actual uh, EV driven boats. And on top, that is the radiators. And it's the new radiator we added for this cooling system so that it helps to dissipate more heat to the space, deep space. So from this side, you can see this are uh, our data acquisition system. And over there, those are all the screens. We run the uh, flight software and the, the ground uh, software. And you can see my colleagues uh, working on this station right now. We are trying to get familiar with the procedures we are going to use for the EVA, uh, also after EVA, how to operate the system. And actually all the procedures uh, we developed for EVA is by, based on this setup here. So here what you are looking at is the MS flight simulators. 
and the Bixelite simulate all the electronics for the AMS. And here I want to specifically present you, this is the um, flat uh, simulator for the main AMS computers. And you can see these are the um, uh, interface with the space station. And uh, for these two cables, these are the 1553 cables, which is right now connected uh, to the other room down the hall, where we were showing the UTDPS uh, lab. And uh, the rest of them, these are uh, MS uh, subdetectors electronics. And this is the uh, simulator for the MS uh, power distribution system. Thank you very much. Right, we'll check in once yeah, more. We'll check in with once more with what's happening um, live at the space station here. So like we said earlier, things are, are moving ahead of our initial schedule, which is which is great. So uh, Luca is going to be moved to the um, work site, the quite complex work site, as we've heard, by Robotic Arm. So I'll just get you to talk me through a little bit here of a, how this movement is happening. Um, or, or Frank, what are we seeing at this stage? So here what we see is that uh, Luca is on the outside of the uh, uh, Canadian uh, robotic arm mm -hmm. on the little platform there, the APFR, as RV uh, uh, has explained, he is attached as well, of course, with a, a security line to that uh, APFR. And now from the inside of the space station, basically the crew is flying slowly Ruka, Luca to his uh, position. It's one of the activities that the crew still does uh, manually. Uh, a lot of the robotic activities uh, today are taken over by the ground. Um, and that's uh, an evolution since we were there on the space station in 2009. In the beginning, the crew almost did all the robotic activities. Now more right. and more, this is done by the ground because of the advanced technologies that they have, the better uh, camera views that we have. But of course, if we have a human, on the outside of the arm, we still want the crew inside um, uh, to, to move the robotic arm. And this is actually one of the trainings, the, the most important trainings that you have in robotics uh, when you train this. Because of course, you have to be very careful. You're playing with a human life at the end of the arm. The arm is very powerful. So if you would drive it, uh, of course, nobody on the outside of the arm can stop it. So you have to be extremely careful. And once you get close to the to the site, it's a little bit like uh, a, a control from the astronaut at the outside on the arm that uh, tells to the astronaut inside a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, a little bit up, a little bit pitch down your right in order so that he can position himself in the ideal position to get ready to be uh, starting uh, his work on the AMS. Because as we have seen from the pictures, the AMS is on the thrust of the space station, so there is not a lot of structure around. The crew can actually not fix themselves or not hold themselves a lot. The, the AMS is standing outside, so the arm is the only way that Luca will be attached uh, to, uh, to the space station from which he can then do uh, all his uh, difficult tasks. So it's very important that he has, of course, the best possible position uh, to, to start his work. Right. And, and what we can add also is that it's a very unique experience for Luca because uh, normally when you perform an EVA, you, have, you are at uh, arm length of the station, you hold yourself, you have a very narrow field of view on what is just in front of you. And now uh, Luca has the unique chance to be uh, there and to fly above the space station. And this is so unique that uh, you see sometimes that he's operating a camera because he's requested to take some pictures that will be used later on uh, for analysis for, for future EVAs. And he has also started to prepare his tool. So uh, uh, Luca is getting a very, very nice experience now, especially now the sun is rising and he should have a wonderful view. So uh, less, of a, less of a spacewalk, more of a space flight for Luca today, but um, Drew is still making his way around the space station, I understand, so he'll get there a different way. And this c the communication that you spoke about, um, is, does Drew play any role in um, that guidance of the astronauts inside with the robotic arm? Uh, on the robotic arm like it is uh, now, uh, probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, once they are closely together with uh, at the work site, of course, yes, because 
uh, as we are all aware, you have to be very careful when you're close to the space station, not to fly the arm into the space station, not to hurt the crew members. As, as we said, you need to stay away from the AMS itself and because you cannot bump into the AMS, otherwise we don't need to do a repair anymore. So that would be uh, the, the end of everything. So there, of course, uh, Drew will certainly also play a role in calling out clearances, for example, to see if we are far away from the space station, if there's still half a meter to go, 20 centimeters to go. So there, of course, uh, Drew will have uh, a very different perspective close to the work site that uh, from the inside of the space station with the camera views you don't have. So certainly he will also there help uh, both Luca and uh, Christine or uh, Serena who's uh, doing the, the arm operations. Okay. And um, just as Paula had at CERN, we've had some questions come through via social media as well. And one of those you actually touched on um, a few moments ago is the positioning of AMS on the space station. So can I just get a bit more of a description about exactly where um, AMS is and a little bit more about why it is so difficult to reach there? Perhaps this is one for you, Stefan. Yes. There we go. <laughs> so, so AMS is on the main thrust, as we have seen in, in these models. Um, it's, it's a complicated position because there is a service module with spare parts for the ISS very close by, and the astronauts basically have to get in between. I don't know, on, on this picture there where you have Luca, above Luca's head, a bit on the left. Um, aha. Yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or up here. I don't Above know if us, the camera as it is really. Can get it. So, so um, I, I don't know if the camera can indeed go <laughs> upstairs, but if we have here this model of the space station just above our heads, and there you can yes. see indeed the AMS just next to these big solar panels. And there are these two other elements which are spare parts, as uh, Stefan just said, and you have to get in between those. Yes, and to connect this cooling system, this is the size of a small fridge. Uh -huh. which which you have to move in there. So and and as AMS was not designed for service, there are no handrails, there's no support. So that's why we need the robotic arm mm -hmm. in space. You always need to support yourself if you want to do any operation. Perfect. Thank you very much for, for answering that question for us. So um we're going to actually pass back over to CERN again. Um so we'll hand over to Paula there. Paula, are you back on the line? Oh, we can't quite hear her yet. Uh, not sure if we've got sound. Let's just see. I think they can still hear it. Oh, here we go. Um, at least we run it. And uh, Andre, can you just quickly comment uh, through? So this is uh, again. Yeah, uh, it is just to remove power to gain access system and this is what Luca is doing right Dr. Morgan yeah. okay we are seeing uh, the system right on the AMS detector this, this is where we are placed Right. That sounds yeah, like maybe. The second way will be to cut into the system to gain access to the tubes and depressurize the system. And the following tool uh, will be uh, to install a mess and check that. Okay, very good. So uh, if you have questions on this part, uh, please send them in now while we're watching a video with Ken Holway, NASA AMS uh, uh, person. An AMS engineer uh, who is going to explain all the tools, the special tools that have been developed uh, by NASA and uh, the very much of complexity of uh, this uh, operation. Um, so the purpose of the EVA is to replace the pumps. So there are four pumps on AMS and, uh, and three of them have failed. We're still operating with one right now. So the new pump package, UTTPS, which is the upgraded tracker thermal pump system. Uh, is being installed via EVA primarily to replace these pumps. There are several other components in there. There's a tank of CO2 to recharge the system. There's a accumulator, exchangers, things, other things. But the key thing are the pumps. This is what the pumps look like. 
Uh, this is the pump inlet here. It's a, it's a centrifugal pump, and this is the outlet. Uh, it has an impeller inside the size of a euro, a euro coin, spinning at about 6,000 RPMs. You can see they're, they're a relatively small piece of hardware, uh, but of course it's very vitally important to the operation of AMS because this is what moves the cool around. So once the crew uh, gets out there and take several pieces of hardware off of AMS uh, to access to where these uh, connections are, these things are called the AMS advanced fitting. Uh, what the crew is going to do is open it up, open the fitting here, and pull this plug out. Now, at that point, they will already have taken uh, some tubing that they have cut from AMS. They, they will cut it with a large bolt cutter and then cut it with a uh, circular tube cutter. And then they'll take this tube and place it inside the fitting. And you can see this piece of tape that's already on there helps gauge how far the, the tube has gone in. Uh, at this point, you can see, I'm not sure if you can see if this close enough, but there's numbers and letters on this. So look at it. In this case, they see, say, E5 on here. What they're going to do is take a wrench, turn this one complete turn back to E5, and then close up this part of the fitting, which seals it. With secondary seals, pull all this off, cover it with insulation, and go to the next one. There's eight of these fittings. And all of these have been sealed. They will give a call to Houston and say, okay, we're, we're done with this. Uh, Houston will give a call to the pop where you're standing now, and he will send a command to open the valves inside the pump box. And then this will pressurize the system, and the crew will come back within an hour, possibly the next EVA, depending on how the time goes. And if they open this up, fitting looks like this, that means the fitting has seen. That means it's in good shape, and go to the next one and do the same thing. If the fitting looks like this, and you see this bright red band, that means that it is neat. There's something went wrong with the fitting inside that uh, is not sealed properly. So with that, they'll take the wrench again, over eighth of the turn, close everything up, and go back and do it again. So it's essentially the same thing you do if you have a leak with uh, working on the plumbing in your house. Uh, if it leaks a little bit, right a little bit. Now, eventually, if um, if they're not able to get it to seal, it can actually be cut off again and then another thing that we call a jumper, which has tubes on it, can be inserted in there to affect the seal. So the unusual thing about this, this is a fitting that leak checks itself. Now there are 29 different tools that have been developed for AMS. Uh, there are many other tools that are already developed, space telescopes, uh, EVAs or spacewalks uh, for shuttle, for station. But AMS being so complex and not really meant to be serviced via EVA, um, it's had several tools that had been developed specifically for it. This has been a fear effort to do this. We have trained the crews in uh, a couple of facilities. Uh, we've done it in virtual reality. We've done uh, you know, tabletop testing or training like this. Uh, but we've also done it in two more specific facilities called the Virtual Buoyancy Lab. Um, that's where they're under water and they simulate weightlessness. And another one called ARGOS, which stands for Active Response Gravity Offload System. This is where we suspend an astronaut over a mock-up of AMS, and it allows them to work in a deeper zero-G environment. While the rest of us are right there with the crew, working with them and interacting with them to understand how to do the job better and better. So um, if I remember right, we have done a total of 33 NBL runs and 24 Argos runs. Um, and uh, the crews have you know, gone through a lot of training, not just Armitano and Drew Morgan on orbit, but several other astronauts have been involved with this uh, since the beginning. So uh, this has been a four-year effort. Tomorrow's the big day that we're uh, going to start doing all this. And uh, we've all got our fingers crossed, and it'll feel like we're, uh, we're all ready to go. Thank you very much, Ken. This was really exciting and a very, very clear explanation of what's going to happen. Thanks a lot. Um, so okay. Thank you. So, um, and if, if you if you missed any of that, don't worry because we're going to get um, Ave on stage here to talk a little bit about the tools a bit further on, and and Stefan as well to talk a little bit more about the science of AMS. So we'll we'll catch you up if any of that was a bit glitchy for you. Uh, just remembering that we are live today. So um, while our astronauts, I'm assured, have a really good communication connection, sometimes we might be a little bit in and out here, but um, just bear with us. 
So uh, can talk a bit about the training and how much has just gone into getting Luca and Drew ready to go out there and uh, perform this spacewalk today. Um, we actually have a video from Luca of that training um, that he performed and we will go to that one now. Extravehicular activity, or EVA training, in NASA's neutral buoyancy pool is routine preparation for any International Space Station mission. But deep amongst the submerged modules, the task that ESA astronaut Luca Palmitano is preparing for will be anything but routine. He's learning to service the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, an instrument that was never designed to be repaired. The Dark Matter Hunter, AMS, has greatly helped scientists to understand the cosmos, so its mission has been extended. But some of its elements need changing, in particular, its degrading cooling system. During the training sessions in Houston, ground support and astronauts need to work together to find the best positions to access the AMS and work out which tools to use. AMS was not made to be repaired EVA. Whenever you have something that was not designed for EVA, you have to come up with very ingenious ideas of how to handle things, how to um, position yourself. Uh, you have to learn how to use new tools that uh, have never been used before. I certainly hope that we can do a good job and perform and repair AMS so that it can keep giving us the amazing science that it's been giving us for the past years. It will be Luca's second mission to the space station, and he's an experienced spacewalker. If it takes place during his stay, repairing the AMS will be the most difficult extravehicular activity since the repair of the Hubble Space Telescope. Inside the space station, he'll also be carrying out an intense schedule of experiments. A wide range of scientific disciplines will be covered, with Luca Palmitano acting as the eyes and ears of researchers on the ground and as an experimental subject himself. Every time a new expedition goes up, we perform many, many new experiments that have never been done before. But some of the experiments that are already on board the space station continue through uh, an expedition for years. So at any time on the space station, we may have between 200 and 300 experiments during the six-month stay, he'll also become the third ever European Space Station commander, a privileged position which brings with it many additional responsibilities. As station commander, you are directly responsible for the success of the mission and the safety of your crew members and the space station. Now, in, in order to achieve success for the mission, the good thing is that I will be the commander of the most trained personnel in the world and of the world. So I don't need to babysit them, I don't need to give direction. I think that by example, and just making sure that the ISS is a, a, a place where they can work at, their, at the best of their capabilities, we will achieve success. Fantastic. So um, we've, we've spoken a little bit about how difficult it is to get to this work site and how Luca is going to be moved to this work site by the robotic arm. And uh, Frank explained earlier a little bit about how that training happens. So what we're going to go to now is a, a really great uh, animation that NASA have prepared that just gives a bit more of an overview of exactly what is happening in this spacewalk today. So we will move to that video uh, now. will be starting out on the first of the AMS repair EVAs. Here we've got Luca Parmitano as EV1 and Drew Morgan as EV2. Luca is here picking up the WIF extender to install on the end of the Canada Arm 2, while Drew is uh, bringing out some tool bags, stowing them on the outside of the airlock and also bringing some with him to translate up the truss as well. Here Luca is proceeding up to meet the Canada Arm 2 where he will start configuring that for the start of this repair series. From here, Drew will pass by Luca, head all the way out to AMS to the Express Logistics Carrier 2, where he will start setting up bags. Drew will make several trips between the airlock and the Express Logistics Carrier in order to bring all the tools for the repairs out to the work site and have them staged and ready for Luca's arrival with the SSRMS. So here, Luca will be setting up the WIF extender, 
followed by the articulating portable foot restraint, which will give him the reach necessary to perform the repairs on AMS since there are no handrails currently installed on that payload for repair activities. Once Luca has his uh, tool bag and is on the end of the SSRMS, he will fly a sweeping range of motion that will take him well over top of the ISS where he'll get a great view of the space station and is able to take lots of video and photos that we can use to keep an eye on the state of the station. As the arm is stretched out and wrapped around the AMS, there will be several places of, of tight clearances the arm operators will have to negotiate for Luca's at the uh, aft and outboard worksite here. You can see him flying up over top of the truss where the arm will wrap around the backside of AMS and push him in between AMS and the ELC in order to reach the worksite to repair AMS's thermal pump system. Once Luca is at that worksite, he'll be removing a debris shield working with Drew to access the primary work area of the AMS repair. Here they're installing a handling aid that'll be used to handle this debris shield after it's removed. There are about a dozen non-captive fasteners that'll be removed in order to release this debris shield. Several will be under these capture cages and they'll be trapped that way. And several will be released using capture forks to be put into a separate uh, capture block so that they are managed and not released as fog. Once all the fasteners are released from the debris shield, Luca will hand it off to Drew, who will be in his own foot restraint, and he will face aft on the ISS and jettison that debris shield. Due to its large size, it is not easy to put that back at the airlock, so jettison is the optimum choice for that shield. Once the debris shield has been removed and jettisoned, Luca and Drew will work together to install other handrails. Here we've installed the, the first uh, three handrails, the diagonal beam handrail, then uh, Drew will hand over two more handrails that Luca will install, that they are the vacuum case handrails. This will allow Luca and Drew better access and mobility at the work site in preparation for the second through fourth EVA of the series. Following the handrail installation, crews will close up their tool bags and make their way back to the airlock. Here Luca is on the end of the arm and will repeat his translation on the end of the arm back to the front of the truss. While he's flying on the arm, Drew will translate around the outside of the ELC and translate back under the mobile transporter back to the airlock for the end of the first of the AMS repair EVAs. Great. Wow. What a journey there. Um, so we talked before about how long it has taken between when the decision was made to um, when this first spacewalk for AMS actually happened. And I was speaking to um, Stefan earlier, and it's actually about four years to the day since the decision was made to here we are stepping out for the first AMS uh, spacewalk. And one of the reasons for this was that the tools had to be specially developed. A lot of the tools, over 20 tools, were specially developed. It's not a matter of just going down to the hardware store. So uh, now we're going to pass over to Ave, who's got um, an, a nice presentation about some of those tools and some of the considerations there. Ave. Thank you, Ali. So uh, just to give you a taste on how complex these uh, EVAs are, Let's spend the next uh, 10 minutes uh, while uh, Luca is approaching uh, the AMS to uh, focus and to get a close insight on what are the tasks that he will have to do. So the first main task will be to remove the debris shield. This is uh, currently what you can see on the picture uh, in, the, in this uh, square, uh, in this rec uh, red rectangle uh, on, on the picture. And this is something which is like big, wide like that, and, and high like this. And this is, of course, something that you they cannot bring back into the airlock. So that's the reason why it will be jettisoned in space later on by Drew. You see on the side of the, of the picture uh, a bunch of tools which are attached to what we call a crew lock bag. A crew lock bag, you have seen it on the picture. That's exactly what you have on the table. That's a typical uh, tool bag that the astronauts are getting outside for EVAs. And the specificity is that uh, you have inside some uh, uh, extender where you can attach with a hook any tool that you carry so that you don't lose the, the tool if you want to operate them. So let's have a look at what is inside and what are the tasks to be done. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Okay, sorry. Now, so what, what has to be done? You have four different work sites on the MS. You have 13 fasteners to be removed 
you have six specifically tools out of the 24 tools that were designed uh, specifically, speci specifically for this mission that will be used this time. And this will take uh, up to two hours and, uh, and 30 minutes to do that. So you see on the middle of the picture, the picture in the middle of, of the slide, uh, different numbers, one, two, three, four. And these are the four work sites where Luca will have to work. And for each of the work sites, this will require a careful positioning of Luca uh, at the top of the arm to be able to access the different work sites. The first task that he will do is to install, install a debris uh, shield and handling aid. So this is a kind of handrail that you see on the picture. Uh, and then you can see in blue on the side. And this handrail will be used later on when uh, all the fasteners are removed from the copper shield uh, to grasp the shield and to give it to Drew, and Drew will be able to send uh, to jettison it in space. You can see below in the four images uh, that you have a nominal position, and I just want to highlight here the fact that uh, because it's the first time uh, EVA, no nothing like that has been done in the past, uh, there is nominal pass, but uh, NASA has already foreseen many different options, alternat alternatives, in case something would not go as expected. And here you have on these pictures, for example, an alternative if uh, Luca is, uh, has some problem to attach the handrail at the initial position that it was foreseen. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay. So now we go for the first work uh, work site, and uh, here you see uh, work site number one and work site number four, which will be the last work site of the activity. You see uh, two arrows, blue arrows, uh, on on each side, and these arrows are currently the location of the two fasteners. Uh, these fasteners, normally when you do EVA in space, uh, every screw needs to be captive because you don't want to lose a screw in space. This would be a projectile that we could come back to the station and cut put the, the, the life of the, of the station and uh, of your crew members into danger. So that's the reason why these ones are not captive. This one not meant to be uh, 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 repaired in space. And you see here two specific tools that were developed for that. So the first one is what we call the eggs head capture tool which is coded blue. And this tool is a kind of screwdriver that uh, um, Luca will use, first of all, to break the torque on each of these fasteners. And then you will catch the head of the screw, like, uh, with, uh, like, uh, it was like a fork, to capture the screw for the final unscrewing of the fastener. And Hervé, I just, uh, d just to interrupt you a little bit, sorry. Um, we see that Luke has actually arrived at the work site now, is that right? So some of these things that you're talking about are, are actually underway as we speak. Yeah, so I mean, you can see it on the, on the other picture on the, on the live TV. So Luca has currently installed uh, the handrail, and uh, for what I see, it's running well. It's a nominal position. So uh, we are already uh, in good shape uh, for, for this first task. Fantastic. Can we go back to the, to the slide, please? <coughs> so when you when Luca will remove the first uh, fastener, the fastener will be captured at the extremity of the tool, but you need to store it somewhere. That's the reason why you have this fastener capture block. This is a, a plate with some holes, and Luca will drop and put inside the screw, the fastener, inside one of these holes. And you will have to do uh, that for two uh, fasteners here and two further on the side four using the same tools. Next slide. Now we are on the second work site, which is called the Interface Panel IPA side, and you have three other fasteners to remove. But here, the strategy that was applied for the previous work site cannot work because the access and the configuration is much more difficult. So what here, Luca will adopt another strategy. So he will use what we call a uh, number 10 Allen bit. This is this kind of uh, screwdriver with a yellow marker on one side. And this screwdriver will be assembled with an extension and a knob, like in the picture on the bottom left side. And he will use this manual screwdriver to uh, break the torque on these three screws. But then we have to make sure that the screws are not lost in space. That's the reason why we have now this debris shield capture cage. It's a kind of cage that uh, Luca will put around the screw, on top of the screw, the on top of the fastener, 
and you see that there is a little window uh, on top of this cage with a hole. And what Luca will have to do then is to insert the number 10 Allen bit through this hole, through the window, to unfasten, unscrew completely the, the fastener, and then the fastener will be free-floating in the cage, but capturing the cage. The cage will be closed, and as you can see, you need one cage per uh, fastener. That's the reason why you will use three cages at this location. Next slide. Then Luca will move to the another work site, work site number three, which is called the di diagonal side. And now we'll have to adapt another strategy. He will still use the knob extension and the 10 Allen bit that was used in the previous uh, work site to break the torque on six fasteners that you have uh, identified with the red arrows on the MS side. When it's done, he will use another tool which has the same kind of fork capture system to capture the head of the screw. This is a socket head capture tool uh, with this uh, red identification. And it will, this tool will be assembled on a pistol grip tool, which is we call the PGT. It's a kind of uh, battery powered screwdriver. And I can show you something here. So it's currently a model that we use in the pool uh, for training. So this is the envelope of the screwdriver. So this is, this is uh, the, the stuff where this socket head will be attached to, and you will remove all, uh, unscrew the screw with that, and it will be up to 12, uh, 12 turns. And when the screw will be removed, each of them will be put into the fastener capture block that you have seen in the previous uh, at work sign number four and, and work sign number three. So you see it's quite complex. It's a kind of a difficult choreography. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And here I just want to uh, put, uh, to highlight what, what kind of difficulties you, you can have just to grab a tool. Uh, the astronauts are very well trained on that. So you, the, the operation that you see in the, in the different sequence below is uh, how to put the uh, uh, Allen bit to the extension with the knob and how to uh, uh, be able to grab it. So just to show you how it works, uh, we don't have exactly these tools here. But we have, we have some, uh, some tools that are looking like. So you have here uh, what we call a ratchet wrench, but it could be you can figure out that it is like this uh, knob and the extension. And then you have uh, the Helen bit, which is put on, a, on a what we call a socket caddy, which is attached to the mini workstation of, uh, of Luca. And to remove this, you need first to remove a pin, to plug it into your tool, and then the tool can be free. At that time, you can put the tool on your extension, and you remove the pin, and you put it back to its location. In that case now, it's solid, at solid attached, and it will not be lost in space. The next step, because the tool is currently attached to the crew lock bag, you need to get another tether, uh, uh, extendable tether like this, and you attach it to the workstation of Luca. This is a kind of structure that Luca is, is wearing in front of him. And at that time, you can detach the tool from the bag, and the tool is currently attached to Luca. So it's Thank you. very yeah. simple, but uh, quite difficult to, to do in a sequence. Thank you, Hervé. That's a great, um, great introduction. And we might have to come back to those tools in the Q&A. But uh, right now, we, we will pass back to uh, Cern, who um, are going to take the floor from here for a little bit. Thank you. Do we have them here? Yes. Can you hear as well? Yeah? It's up. Keep going. So we had a mission just a few moments ago. And we mentioned that we from the world who have combined with very good job.
<laughs> right. And um, sorry, Paula, we're having a bit of difficulty with the sound there. So what we're going to do is we're going to just bring it back in house here at um, at EAC, and we will uh, pass over to um, Stefan Shaw now to talk us through um, a bit more of the science behind um, the ba behind the AMS. So um, we believe he's got um, a, a bit of a presentation. We'll just move, make our way through to that. Um, shortly, sorry, bear with me for a couple of seconds. Okay, so. <laughs> the heat should be removed. Therefore, we have tracking, uh, tracker thermal cooling system. So it's an essential element for the functioning uh, of the whole detector. Yeah, absolutely. We have another question from Twitter. Wouldn't it be easier to bring the alpha magnetic spectrometer home uh, for repair, Perhaps rather so. than doing it in space with four EVAs? Uh, we would like to do so, but there is no shuttle. And AMS uh, is supposed to be launched and brought back by okay. shuttle. Okay. Are we fine, guys? Yeah, we're okay. back to normal. <laughs> Can we keep going? Uh, apparently, there are a few problems with sound, but uh, uh, we keep <laughs> going. <laughs> Okay, so I would like to invite everyone to send us questions, especially now on the science of AMS, because we're going to okay. talk about that very soon. Um, the Twitter hashtag, uh, the hashtag is spacewalk for AMS. Use this hashtag on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and we will answer your questions live, and those we cannot take live, we will uh, uh, answer offline. It's now time, before going to the physics of AMS, to take a, a little look at uh, its uh, history, which, as Alberto said before, it's a long history dating back to 1995. Can you all? No, we, we seem to be missing the sound here. Stefan, are, are you able in any way to explain what it is that we can see on the screen here? I know it's moving very fast. <laughs> yes, in principle, I'm able to, to explain what you see on the, on the screen. It's, it's the assembly of, of AMS, the construction phase, and then we moved it to STEC into a climate chamber and tested uh, for thermal performance. Uh, that's what we see on the screen. Now it's in the climate chamber. This is the transport and back to CERN moving very fast, <laughs> <laughs> as you can see. This is in the test beam area at CERN for calibration um, with, with beams of, of known particles. Um, and that's at the airport in Geneva when a Galaxy C5, yeah. <laughs> this, this movie was running too fast. <laughs> <Yeah. So laughs> I think it was an excellent effect. when a Galaxy C5 <laughs> picked it up and brought it directly to Kennedy Space Center for the launch. But um, yeah, with, with no sound, it, it makes not too much sense. Yeah, Please fantastic. Back, which you. shows the space station at any moment, uh, where the space station is now. And then there is a huge number, 148 billion and many more millions. And what is that number, Alberto? So uh, this is the number of the events that uh, AMS has collected up to now. This is a huge statistic uh, of cosmic rays. Uh, and, uh, but uh, by the way, th these cosmic rays are coming from outside at, uh, uh, at very high energy. And this kind of uh, statistic is uh, unprecedented. No other experiment that did this kind of measurement of uh, uh, cosmic rays uh, uh, directly in space uh, has been ever able to collect such a statistics. Thanks uh, to the uh, huge dimension of AMS and the long exposure time. And also for the especially uh, good position on the outside of the space station. Yes. What is the advantage of being there? So the advantage of being outside uh, in the space, this is not open space, but however, we are above the atmosphere. So what happens is that these uh, cosmic rays that are high energy particles, they come, they strike into the atmosphere. And here on ground, in fact, uh, we don't experience uh, uh, the dramatic effect that uh, high energy particle would have uh, on our body. And uh, this is why we go to space, to measure those directly without the effect, uh, let's say, of the atmosphere. And this is also one of the reasons 
one of the, let's say, practical reason why AMS is important. To measure this kind of cosmic rays uh, is important for the travel of human in space. So you, we can understand better uh, how this radiation that is uh, a dangerous thing for the human can be, uh, let's say, uh, predicted, controlled, uh, design of the spacecrafts uh, can be uh, specially designed for uh, uh, dealing with this, uh, with this radiation. Okay, now I have a question for Mercedes. Uh, how does AMS track so precisely each cosmic ray going through uh, its various uh, layers, its various components? This is because uh, we have a lot of uh, sub-detectors which measure uh, in uh, many parts uh, the charge or the particles and also the energy. And by measuring what we call the spectra, so the intensity of each uh, species uh, as function uh, of the, the energy, we can uh, understand uh, uh, which is the origin of these cosmic rays and what happened to them while they travel uh, through the interstellar medium in the magnetized plasma. And here you see the, uh, the several sub-detectors, so this is the time of flight, and this is the heart of the detector, the magnetic spectrometer, which allow us, thanks to, the, to a magnet and the tracker, to uh, uh, measure negatively and positively charged particles, so to investigate uh, primordial antimatter, which could be residual still uh, in, the, in the cosmos. And this here you see how we measure uh, with the ring imaging sharing of uh, the velocity of the particle, the one per mil precision, and this is the electromagnetic calorimeter, which allows us a very precise determination of energy of electrons and positrons. Okay, we have a few questions. Uh, thank you for uh, answering my call. Um, so, from Instagram, does the cosmic particle affect the astronauts who are currently working in space? Who wants to take that? Ma Mercedes? Yeah, I can take it. So, indeed, uh, yes, they have... Um, they, are, they receive all these flux of uh, charged particles, so it's uh, much more than the, the radiation you will take when you take an X-ray. So that's why the, the missions on the, on the space station are uh, limited. They don't stay there all the time, but only for s several uh, months. And also NASA is, is uh, very interested in studying these effects. They, they did this study with the two twin astronauts, the Kellys. One stayed on Earth, and the other one was for a um, long time mission in the space station. Then they looked at which kind of uh, uh, change in the, the DNA was caused by cosmic rays. Okay, we have a question on the science of AMS from Twitter. Out of the billion particles detected so far since its functioning, which percentage of matter versus antimatter has been detected so far? So, uh, the, uh, the cosmic rays are composed by many things, uh, okay, matter and antimatter. Let's uh, do a small breakdown of those. So the majority of the particles that we are detecting, those are protons, high energy protons and helium nuclei. Then there are other matter uh, species, uh, other nuclei, electron also, that is uh, still matter. Then the most abundant antimatter component that we observe is a positron that is kind of 10 to the minus 4, is uh, one-tenth of uh, per mil uh, of, the, of, of the cosmic rays that we observe. Then there are even lower components of antiprotons, and you will see in the, the discussion uh, that we will have that we also observe some hint of a very, very rare component of uh, uh, anti-helium. Okay, we don't want to anticipate uh, too much, but uh, please stay tuned because later on we are going to have uh, Professor Samuel Ting, principal investigator of the AMS collaboration, Nobel laureate for physics, who is going to give you a really nice uh, overview of all the fantastic new results that AMS has produced and even some that have not been published yet. So. Uh, after the next uh, link with uh, the ESA Astronaut Training Center in Cologne, we will have uh, more science from AMS. Keep sending your questions, and over to you, Ali. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. More science from AMS. Okay, and here we are back at the European Astronaut Center, and um, we will bring back uh, Stefan, but we won't make him speak as quickly this time. Uh, <laughs> and he has a presentation, also a few few pictures that we will bring up on the screen to talk a little bit more um, about AMS. If we can do that. Oh, yes. Okay. Here we go. So this time it works. Now, what you see on this picture is a photograph of AMS on the space station. And um, it gives you the scale because you can see two astronauts.
close to it. So it's operational since May 2011. And um, yeah, we have recorded more than 145 billion. The exact number is now 148. Um, and we want to keep this experiment running for the lifetime of space station due to its excellent science that it is producing. Now, if you go to the next slide, now that gives you roughly the scale. So on the right, you see AMS. Um, you see this debris shield that we were talking all the time about. And at the moment, Luca is really trying hard to, to get the fasteners off. So it's, I'm, I'm watching with one eye always what we see on, th on the right. So um this was, Sorry, this was actually one question that came through on social media as well, is what contingencies are in place if, if you can't remove the debris shield? Is there, do we know what happens from there? Okay, so if we can't remove the debris shield, we are not able to access the pipes that we need to cut. Okay. So um, if we really can't, so I, I mean, Luca is really excellent trained for this. Mm -hmm. But if it turns out that we can't remove the debris shield, then we have to sit together and think about a solution. Okay. Um, there's, there's no easy way to get access if you are not able to remove the debris shield. So normally what you would do at home, if, if, if there are fasteners that you cannot get off, yeah, you will drill the head off, right? Mm -hmm. And remove the thing. Um, on space station, uh, I mean, these are extra hard fasteners to keep the debris shield in place. So it's not that you can easily take them off. And you have seen that they are in very difficult locations. And I, what I find amazing, if you look, I mean, I, I'm looking to this picture, I find this much more interesting than my slides at the moment. Um, because you can see these gloves. Um, they are over there. Am, am I allowed to touch them, Evie? Am I allowed to touch one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I really appreciate <laughs> this. I always wanted to do it. So, so now I use this opportunity. So, so look <laughs> to these gloves yeah? and, and, and think about the fasteners that, that he has to take away in, in, in this location, which is, which is extremely difficult, even if you would not have these gloves. But what it makes more complicated, they are pressurized. So you have one bar pressure inside here. So if, if you just try to close your hand, you have to do it against the vacuum, yeah, which, which is really a hard job. And, and now you have to do it in this, this complicated place. But OK, go to the next slide. I have to go through the slides in, in very short time. <laughs> so this is the cooling system. So it looks like, like a complicated diagram, but if you just there's something um, uh, on the left, the green part, that's our instrument inside the magnet. Okay, and we produce a heat of only 120 watt, which, which are two lamps in, in your house, 60 watt each, right? So it's not a lot of heat, but it inside the magnet, y you have no atmosphere for, for conduction, so you have to take it out by a cooling system. If you don't take it out, it thermally runs away. Now, um, there are eight connections to this cooling system which you have to cut. And, and to give you an impression, these cooling pipes, this is this diameter, okay? And this is a glove, okay? Now, whoever wants to, no, no heavy said nobody tries, but okay? <laughs> you have to pick them, you have to cut them, and you have to connect eight new ones, okay? And you have to do this leak tight. So these are fluid lines under high pressure. 50, 60 bar. Um, you have to do this leak tight. So that's a capability NASA did not have, and I guess ESA also does not have. So think about the life support system on space station. They are fluid lines. So if they break, how do you fix them? Okay, you need connectors. Now, what you have seen from Ken, these are these devices to do this connection. Now, again, you have to do it with these gloves. So, so you have to manipulate these. And, th and the main thing that NASA developed is um, in Aachen with us is how to get an impression or a measurement if you have a leak tight connection or not. Imagine you have eight of them, okay? And you measure that your system is leaking. How do you know which one you have to fix, okay? If you do it randomly, you make the si situation worse and not better. So that's... That's why this here has a visual leak indicator which just turns red if this thing is leaking. <coughs> Sorry. In the fourth EVA, that's what the astronauts will do. They will go back to the site and look for the visual leak indicators. If one of them is red, they will tighten it by a half a turn more and then it should be fine. That's what we learned from all the training sessions. 
So you stop me. Yeah, I can stop on any slide I and I'm you can intrigued. come back to it's this. Carry okay. on. Okay. <laughs> so go to the next one. Now you you can ask yourself you you need a cooling system in space and actually it's it's not a trivial cooling liquid. It's um, CO2, carbon dioxide, and we run it in a two-phase mode. So it's half liquid and half uh, in a gas phase. Um, it goes to the radiators, it's cooled down to liquid, and then comes back to the pump. Now, who, who on this planet has experience with two-phase cooling systems in space, or at, at all CO2 systems in space? And that's why they came to Aachen, because we have constructed the upper third of AMS, which is called transition radiation detector. And if, if we lose connection and we have time, then I will explain you what a transition radiation detector is. W what you need to know and what you see on these graphs, it's, it's roughly a diameter of 2 meter 20, a height of 60 centimeter, 500 kilogram of hardware filled with detectors. And it gives you an, an impression what you have inside AMS. Um, and, and how difficult it is to access these small cooling pipes with these gloves without damaging the neighboring electronics um, so that the instrument can still work. So go to the next one. Okay, so this is this cooling system. Um, it, it, it is a really complicated system because if you once cut these pipes, then all the CO2 of the system which was in there is gone. So you need to refill. You need to reconnect, you need to refill. So that's why there is a refill vessel. Then you have a lot of control electronic which is custom made to just run this cooling system. You have startup heaters, um, you have cool orbit heaters, so the thermal environment is changing. You have a lot of control electronic to run these heaters. Um, and then you have this pump assembly. There are these four pumps, which you have seen before in Ken Volvik's presentation, these small pumps, which are the heart of this cooling system. Um, these are improved versions of the pumps that failed on orbit before. So we investigated, invested two years just to understand how one needs to build these pumps to be able to pump liquid CO2. Liquid CO2 is a very difficult fluid to pump. It's, it's like pumping sand. Um, so if you are not very careful with surfaces and um, you just damage your pump as a function of time and that's actually what happened with the pumps that we had up there before. So this is what was, was constructed in Aachen. Go to the next one. Okay, so this is the final object uh, in a climate chamber when we do thermal tests. And now you see on the side in this white foam, there are eight of these connectors. So what Luca has to do he has to pull them off this cooling system. There are pipes which are spiraled on the lower part. He has to pull it off, these four millimeter pipes, and bring them in the direction where he needs to connect to the old system. That, that was he has to do, and then he has to slide in here, the other pipe, do some turns here, yeah. This is not I was so going to say, how do you fancy yourself doing this repair, Frank? If <laughs> let's see. He is an astronaut. Yeah, yeah, okay. we can he do a live demonstration. He, he, he has not been trained, <laughs> but let's see. Okay, yes, you're coming closer. So you have to turn this one. N yes, this one. Get it loose. Now you can take this one out. Excellent. You slide this one. No, the other way around. Sorry, because it has this cupped on tape. It tells you how far, then you turn again. Very good. And then you put it back together. Exactly. And then you come, yes, you have a tight connection. You come back for the next EVA. You open this again, take this off. Okay. And now you look to this. If it looks like this, everything is perfect. But if this here is like, like this, and you see the red ring, then this connection has a problem, okay? You take this little wrench, this little one, they have a much larger one because it has to fit in this, okay? You put it here, you, you do an eighth of a turn, you close this again, and then you recheck later if it stays like this or if you see the red thing again, okay? You stop me.
I, I, I continue talking. Go to Thank the next you. slide. I was just going to say that perhaps we should check in with what's happening on the on the live cam outside the space yes. station because I understand some of this work is is underway. So we'll we'll check in and see what's happening up there. Okay, if you if you had the chance to, to look at the uh, at what's going on on, uh, on real time on, on the t on TV, uh, you can see uh, Luca working on now on the work site uh, number two. Uh, which means the good news is that the two screws, the two fasteners that were on work site number one have been removed and collected. And now Luca is currently working on the three that you have on this side. And he seems that he has broken the torque and now he's looking at the uh, cages that he has to put on uh, the fasteners to capture each of them. So, so far we are in excellent shape and everything is running uh, as we expect. Perfect. And and while the all of this is going on on the outside of the station space station, um, Andrea, there's actually a lot of science that's still happening inside. Can you tell us a little bit about what the other astronauts are doing at the moment? Absolutely. So we have uh, six crew on board the the space station at the moment. Two of them are outside. Two of them are the specialist, uh, what we call IV. Um, so intravehicular specialists uh, operating the robotic arm and also being the IV coming with the astronauts for the EVA. And then we have two other crew members that are continuing to work and do science. And uh, one of those crews, Sasha, is actually working with one of my colleagues on console here at the Astronaut Center in the control room on a joint uh, European-Russian experiment called Plasma Crystal 4. So we're just finishing up uh, today with the final um, part of this uh, specific campaign uh, where we're working together with colleagues uh, live in France as well as other parts of Germany as well um, and looking at this uh, plasma crystal uh, collaboration experiment which is going extremely well. Um, in addition to that uh, we have uh, another Russian colleague who's doing further science in another uh, module and laboratory of the International Space Station. So uh, here we, we actually, even though we're in Cologne, it's a collaboration Europe-wide. Uh, so mission control-wise, there isn't just Houston like the movies. Uh, there are actually five mission controls around the world. So you have Houston, you have Huntsville in, in the state of Alabama. You have uh, Munich, which is uh, the European uh, main control center. It's physically in Oberpfaffenhofen and then partially also here in Cologne, as well as science centers uh, in several other European countries. Um, and then we have Scuba in Japan and um, Moscow in Russia. So we all work together and we're in constant uh, communication and collaboration uh, working with the four different science laboratories. And as Luca mentioned, uh, we're doing around 200 different science experiments um, at any given mission for the International Space Station. Fantastic. I mean, it truly is an international space station, a lot of international collaboration that goes on. Um, and we, uh, we've we talked a lot about it. The, the robotic arm was how Luca was transported to the site today. Um, and robotics are going to be becoming even more important as we move through to the next stage of exploration below, uh, beyond, sorry, beyond low Earth orbit. Um, and actually, coming up, Luca's got another really interesting technology technology demonstration that um, you might be able to tell us a bit more about. I understand it's, he's going to be operating a rover remotely, analog one. Yes, so on Monday, Luca will be doing uh, the first ever real-time um, operation of uh, what we call Analog One. Uh, so we have a series of experiments that we started uh, back in um, 2011, approximately. So I was one of the first test astronaut drivers of a little Lego uh, robot, and that was sort of how we began. And then we expanded the robotics program um, using a, a delay-tolerant network, so kind of a space internet designed for astronauts who are orbiting um, in a station or on a spacecraft to be able to drive interplanetary rovers. And uh, we started with this really small uh, LEGO experiment controlled out of Belgium at BUSOC, one of the specialist science centers. Uh, and then uh, it was expanded and expanded, and this Metaron Robotics project um, has gone uh, throughout the years and been operated by many different European astronauts to control everything um, from smaller robots to the lunar um, rover example in the Netherlands to uh, the ExoMars rover, for example, in the UK um, and, and several other uh, robots around Europe. So on Monday, Luca will be doing uh, something particularly special because he's going to be controlling a very large rover in the Netherlands which has been set up on a 
a very, very large surface which has also um, a regolith simulant. So he'll be driving the rover and due to his um, specialist geology training because of the European Astronaut Centre's Caves and Pangaea program, he's actually been trained on how to assess and look at the rocks and the different geological um, samples that the robot will be able to um, come across during this experiment and Luca will be the one to assess which samples are of significance and which ones he will use the end effector of the robot um, on the rover to actually uh, sample during that mission as well. So we'll be controlling that here uh, from the European Astronaut Centre on Monday and you can also uh, follow that live. Fantastic. Thank you. I find that really fascinating. Um, another thing that I, just moving back to the spacewalk again, another thing that I find interesting <laughs> is the fact that um, the preparation that goes in. So I, we saw early this morning, Luca was already suiting up, ready to, to step out the door. And I know um, in my conversations that I've had with different people, different astronauts, um, because of the pure oxygen environment inside the suit, you can't do things like use deodorant or have a shower the day before, so I'm not sure I'd make a great astronaut. Um, but I understand we have a video of the preparations that Luca was going through this morning, so we, we might play that one at this stage. It's a bit of a time lapse. Okay, so... We might need a little bit of an explanation as, as to, oh, here we go, as to what exactly is going on here, what the suiting up process is. Is that something you'd be able to explain to us, Frank or Hervé? Yeah, sure. So what you see, you see uh, Luca was uh, already uh, uh, donning uh, half of the suit and you have seen him with a, with a mask. It's an oxygen mask, so uh, he has to pre-breathe oxygen uh, to make sure that he's getting rid of all the nitrogen that he has in his blood uh, to avoid to have the bands because uh, pressure will be, will be reduced in the suit compared to the ambient pressure of the, of the, the ISS. And now you see uh, his crewmates currently doing the full assembly, uh, putting the helmet and then uh, they will uh, pressurize the suit and start to uh, do the comb check uh, to verify that all the suit system is working properly. Then they will have to install the mini work station which is uh, currently a tool uh, carrier that uh, Luca will get uh, in front of him. Uh, and you see that they're also equipping the, the shooting up the Drew, uh, the crewmate, they are just facing each other. So this takes quite some time and you need to be very careful in each of the steps because uh, if you miss something or if something is not according to the plan, this can be critical later on. Uh, and But they are doing this very well and uh, yeah, this is, Continuing. So you can see it, it, it's quite a process. It takes a long time um, to be able to be ready to step out beyond the space station. Yeah, what is always amazing, of course, from a crew perspective is that you have to imagine that in uh, for an EVA like this, you're about 10 to 11 hours locked up in a suit. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is quite uh, strenuous. I, I think EVA is certainly the, the most complex task uh, that you can do, uh, regardless of the AMS or not. It's the most complex task that you can do on board of the space station uh, today, both in a physical sense, because uh, uh, as Stefan explained, uh, being under pressure in this suit, it's difficult to move, it's difficult to grab something with your hands. So physically, it's very hard. Uh, but also from a psychological side, uh, it's tough because, uh, of course, once you go out of the door, uh, you're on a timeline because mm -hmm. you only have a limited amount of resources, a limited amount of oxygen, a limited amount of CO2 removal capability for your suit. So you have to be able to finish all the tasks that had planned for you within the timeline that you have. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really a, a very complex and, uh, and uh, yeah, difficult task to do. Yeah, and to, to, to jump on that, uh, uh, that's right, that when you are inside the suit, and, and I've been inside, I know what I'm talking about, it's, it's you have really to be, to be uh, concentrated, and it's uh, something where you should not be claustrophobic. Uh, you are confined in a very narrow environment for more than 10 hours. Uh, no way to scratch your nose, or you have, if you have a pain somewhere, you have to, to, to uh, accept it. And uh, it's very narrow. Each time you move your 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 legs or your arms, uh, you have contact with uh, with the shoe structure. 
and to give you an example on how complex it is, when you, you close your hand just to grab something, it's like if you were pressing a tennis ball. And you have to do that more than 200 times during an EVA. And I can tell you that what currently Luca is doing, which is a very precise surgery with his gloves and putting all these efforts to uh, remove the screws, this is uh, quite painful for him. But he knows what it is. Uh, he has been trained for that. Uh, but it's not a pleasure, a pleasure time. So, and in a lot of ways, I mean, for us watching a spacewalk, six and a half hours seems like a long time, but it can also be a short time. You have to get so much done. Um, and it's, I imagine it'll be a bit of a relief when he gets back inside the space station again to, to see his colleagues. So I've just been alerted that we've got CERN on the line again. So we'll check in with Paula and see how things are going over there. Paula, do we have you there? Back and we, we are extremely excited. You guys are working in the dark because the space station is in China and is in the dark. We have a question from the right. Got a bit of sound difficulty. <laughs> we have questions from their site. Uh, for you, Mercedes, why didn't you Here build the um, AMS inside the space station so it would be easier to do any repairs? Actually, this will uh, screw up our physics because we do not want <laughs> material on top of the detector because otherwise the particles will interact and break up and we lose our advantage of being in space on top of the atmosphere. And anyhow, AMS is quite big. It's five meters times four meters times three meters, so too big anyhow to fit inside. There is another question um, on a similar subject, always from IFLS. Uh, isn't it time to get robots do this kind of work outside the station? Maybe it's more yeah. a question for Isa. Yeah, what do you I think, anyway? Yeah, <laughs> but it's actually a very complex work. The, also, humans uh, can react if something doesn't go according to the plans, while to teach a robot, uh, we are still uh, far away. Okay, so it's now time to go much deeper into the physics of this wonderful, unique detector in space. And I would like uh, um, you to show part of a conversation we had yesterday with the principal investigator, Nobel laureate Samuel Ting, on why AMS is so unique. What is the physics purpose that justifies such a big effort uh, to service the AMS detector in space and uh, make it possible for it to live as long as the space station? Yeah, I'm really glad to have this opportunity to explain to you and to interested community about what we're doing. This, as you have corrected now, this repair it's a major endeavor carried out by NASA. And even though we are not a NASA experiment, NASA has put in major, major effort to make this possible. The purpose of this repair is to enable us to continue collect data until the lifetime, for the lifetime of space station. What is shown in this slide is shown the AMS detector, which is a, a spectrometer normally used at CERN to identify different particles. So as you can see, electrons, protons, positrons, antiprotons, all these particles go through the seven detector and now combine together into five with different type of charges. We have been on the space station for eight years and we have collected 148 billion cosmic rays up to energy of trillion electron volts. This is much more than all the cosmic ray collected in the last hundred years. 
amazing, much more uh, cosmic recorded than in the last 100 years in only eight years' time That's on the right. station. That's uh, amazing. AMS is often dubbed uh, the uh, dark matter hunter, but I think it's a bit reductive because there are a lot of physics domains that uh, you do investigations into with AMS. Can you summarize? Yeah, in, in, in fact, uh, AMS is a very versatile detector and uh, it's unique uh, uh, because it's a magnetic spectrometer. So it allows it to differentiate between uh, matter and antimatter particles. And this opens broad uh, perspective to, to study all the new sources in our galaxy or even outside the galaxy. So dark matter is one, anti complex antimatter is another example, and new astrophysical sources are third example, and in general, understand origin uh, of the cosmic rays is yet another example. Okay, so about dark matter, we are going now to see another part of the interview with uh, Professor Ting, who uh, is going to tell us more about dark matter. Let's take a look. The reason we will continue to collect data, and why we want to collect data, why it's so important to collect data, is shown in the next slide. One of the very important results carried out by Andrew Kooning and uh, uh, others from Aachen, from Perugia, and from Italy, uh, from, uh, and from uh, CMR, as well as from uh, China, is the study of antimatter cosmic rays, particularly anti-electron, normally known as positrons. In space, with the current knowledge, positrons can come from three sources. One is normal cosmic ray collision. <coughs> For normal cosmic ray collision, they produce energy energy can change into positrons. So one source is positrons from collision. Another source is, is from pulsars. Pulsar is a rotating neutron star from a light ray going to the rotating neutron star, which has a strong magnetic field. It produces electron positrons. The third possibility, which is why everybody is interested in, if dark matter are particle-like, when they collide, they also produce energy, energy produce positrons. So positrons have three possible sources. Next slide. So this is our measurement from very low energy of uh, one billion electron volt to 1,000 billion electron volt. The yellow part is all data. On the, on the vertical axis is the flux. And you can see all data, which is based on 1.9 million positrons. At very low energy, it can come from, it must come from, collision of cosmic rays. Because the, sh the shaded gray er blue area agreed with the yellow data point. But then, as you can see, at higher energies, there's a question mark because it cannot be explained become by what everybody assumes must be the case. And so the, one with the, the region with the yellow part indicates something new has happened. And this is a very, very important result because nobody predicts such a behavior. Over the last 20 years, and there's been many, many measurements uh, from low, at low energies, and uh, this measurement can be explained by positron collision. Nobody has reached such a high levels down, and this is unexpected. Nobody has seen before. Next slide. So, naturally, if the low energy part can be explained by collision of cosmic ray, 
the high energy part must be the other two causes from pulsars or dark matter collision because there are no other possibilities. And if you add up these two possibilities, you have the yellow curve, which is good agreement with your data. A very important thing is the spectrum above 800 GV, the data above 800 GV goes down very quickly. And there's a cutoff energy of 810 GV, and uh, that means above 800 GV, the spectrum goes down quickly, and this is totally unexpected. This cutoff is a step with a probability of 0 0.9999. So this is a totally unexpected new phenomenon. Next one, please. Indeed, this spectrum agrees with dark matter collision with dark matter particle of 1.2 TeV. <coughs> also, if you look the magenta curve, that's based on one of the models, and sh in this curve shows we have uh, the data has a maximum around 300 GV, and then above 800 GV, it just falls down quickly. It, this is a, a totally new phenomenon, and is in good agreement with dark matter model. But you look the size of the error at the highest energy point. The, the size of the error is quite large, and so we can, where you agree with dark matter model, you need much more data to ensure, indeed, agree with this curve. The next slide, please. The next slide shows the electron and positron results. On top of the curve is the electron. It's based on 28 million events. The electron is very different from positron. It's the sum of two power laws power law A and power law B. If you add up power law A and power law B, you will get the green curve, and you can see the green curve agrees with the data. And it's very mysterious why the electron is not like positron. It can only be explained by two power law. For positrons, the flux is much lower than the electron, and low energy come from collision, and high energy is mostly come from dark matter. Next one. Pulsars, when they, when they, when a light ray go into a pulsar, it produce electron positron pair. It does not produce antiproton proton pair. It, this is because the proton mass is 2,000 times heavier than electrons. So there's not enough energy to produce a pair of proton and antiproton. But dark matter collision will produce proton and antiproton. And this is a very new data, and which shows the positron spectrum and the antiproton spectrum are very similar. And this similarity will indicate this excess most likely cannot come from pulsars. So this is a additional evidence. The positron has a high probability from, come from dark matter. So Professor Thing has uh, gone through a sequence of uh, smoking guns pointing at the existence of dark matter. Andre, has AMS found dark matter? Not yet. Uh, we see a lot of indications for dark matter, but at this moment we cannot claim that dark matter is found. And to do so, we do need much more data, at least twice as much data, to increase precision of our measurements and also to go higher in energy. This way, for instance, for positron spectrum, we will see complete disappearance of dark matter contribution. And this will be a decisive observation.
So this is one more reason why we need uh, this uh, repair. Absolutely. Uh, because data is extremely precious at the very this very specific moment on the verge of uh, an important discoveries, maybe. So, um, Alberto, uh, we are going to see now um, some more uh, physics on a different subject, the subject of nuclei. Basically, what I understand is that uh, we are being flooded by the periodic table of elements from the universe. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, in fact, uh, antimatter is a very important subject in the physics of AMS, uh, but even matter is, uh, is uh, very important matters. In fact, uh, uh, we have in the cosmic ray, the most uh, abundant component of the cosmic rays are, in fact, uh, nuclei from all the periodic table of the elements, just because uh, this is the material that is around, it, it gets accelerated in the space. So we observe this, and from uh, the different uh, properties of different nuclei, we can understand which ones uh, are produced at source and travel out to us, and instead which ones uh, instead are produced during the travel of the cosmic rays by collision with the interstellar medium. This we call secondaries, while the ones that are coming from uh, uh, the direct sources, like carbon and oxygen, this we call primaries. If you compare these uh, spectra of the primaries, carbon and oxygen, and secondaries, like lithium, beryllium, and boron, you can understand properties of the galaxy. And in fact, one of the latest publications that we did found uh, a thing that was not uh, uh, ever seen before, that even for the secondary spectra, we observe a deviation of their, of their spectra that is much more, uh, much more important than the one that we observe for the primaries. And this points to new mechanics uh, uh, ruling the propagation of the cosmic rays in our galaxy. Let's listen to what Professor Ting has to say about uh, this very subject of nuclei from space. ...of all the elements in the periodic table. And we found cosmic rays basically have two classes. The first class we call primary cosmic ray, and that is hydrogen, helium, carbon, ion, and they are produced from fusion process in the stars and accelerate to high energy by explosion of stars. So that is called primary cosmic ray. Then there's secondary cosmic ray, like lithium, beryllium, boron. They are produced by collision of primary cosmic ray with other cosmic ray particles. You produce lithium, beryllium, and boron. But in space, so far, we imagine there are only two classes of cosmic rays. But they are going in all directions, come from different origins, and uh, the question is, is there, a is there a common law describe the behavior of the primary and the secondary? Before us, nobody ever asked this question because there are very little data and only a low energy and very, very large errors. Next slide, please. So we have been able to systematically measure all the elements on the periodic table. And this is a summary of the current data to about a few months ago. And uh, you can see we, ha we have analyzed data up to software. We have done this because they have very high statistics. And we will continue to collect data for the lifetime of the space station. And so the rest of the elements, namely the ones uh, labeled in, in yellow, and we have to wait. They have enough statistics in order to make an accurate measurement. So this is a second motivation namely understand the behavior of all the cosmic rays in space. So far, we have been eight years, and we can measure from proton to silicon. Eight or more years to measure all the way to zinc and maybe beyond. This is just simple time requirement to collect enough data. Next slide, please. Already, from our current data, we found a totally unex unexpected phenomenon. That is, 
primary cosmic ray, helium, carbon, oxygen. And if you look at dependence as function of rigidity, rigidity means energy or momentum per unit charge. Charge is the location on the periodic table. So if you look at this curve, you will see primary cosmic rays, helium, carbon, oxygen, and they have exactly the same rigidity dependence. And secondary cosmic ray, lithium, beryllium, boron, also have exact same rigidity dependence, but they are different from primary. And that means we now have a way to classify cosmic rays. And one is primary, has one energy dependence, another secondary has its own energy dependence. This is a totally new observation, not predicted by anyone, not expected by any theory. So not just uh, news on dark matter, but also on nuclear in space. We will continue with the science uh, uh, later. And now back to Isa Cologne. Thank you very much, Paula. Right, so from uh, cosmic rays and then the birth of the universe back to uh, things that are a bit more expected and scheduled, which is the um, spacewalk that we have going on at the moment. So we'll just check back in, see what's happening on the live feed from space. Um, and I'll ask you to give us a little bit of an update on where we're at, uh, Hervé. Okay, so um, if you recall the presentation I have, I have shown you before, you recognize here the PGT and uh, the socket head capture tool, this is what we call the red bit. And we are currently at work site number three, and Luca is removing the six uh, fasteners that are here. He has already removed four. He's proceeding very well, uh, so far so good, and pretty soon we'll be only two screws away from the release of the debris shield, so, uh, so far so good. And at that stage, that's when Drew will um, jettison the shield. Yeah, so we can give some heads up on that. Uh, so once the debris shield is uh, released from uh, AMS, uh, Luca will grab it, give it to uh, Drew. Drew is uh, fastened, uh, installed in the APFR, the same platform by the feet, so he's very stable. And then he will have to throw away the, the cover uh, backward uh, in, a, in a retrograde mode, so in the back of the station to slow it down and you will throw it away backwards and a bit uh, down to the earth. So what will happen, there is this big debris and before that I have to mention that the capture cage that you have seen before where the screws are captured inside plus the capture block where we have all these holes for the other screws, they will be attached to the handrail of the uh, debris shield and everything will be thrown away in one block. The objective is to get rid of this. Uh, to this will go on an orbit that will have a, a, a lower uh, perigee. The orbit will be lower than the one of the space station. Of course, uh, the orbit of the space station and the orbit of this um, uh, debris shield will have a common point, which is where they separate it together. Uh, but uh, the advantage is that this is quite big and this can be tracked by uh, the ground stations. So we will know ever all, all the time where this debris shield is. If for any reason there is a risk of potential collision in the future, uh, NASA will take all the precautions to increase uh, the, the altitude of the space station. This is a standard procedure. So, and the fact that the orbit is lower uh, and the perigee is lower, that means that uh, the, the debris shield will come to a, a zone where you are much more atmosphere particle around. This will slow down the debris shield and we expect uh, this debris shield to re-enter in the Earth's atmosphere in around one year or two. So um, that will be the next step of, uh, of, of the activity to throw this away. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, and we're just about to open it up to questions from the floor, but I had one more from social media um, before we move to that. Was uh, with the removal of the debris shield, um, Stefan, perhaps this is a good one for you. Will, is there plans to put a new shield in place or how will it work at the end of the Spacewalk series? Okay, so part of this area will be covered by the new cooling system um, and there will be a lower part which, which is left open and this whole area will be covered by, by MLI for thermal reasons afterwards, um, but there will be no new debris shield there. No new shield there, okay. 
Thank you very much. Um, so, did we have any questions from the floor at this stage? No, nothing. Nothing further to add? Uh, you must have submitted them all via social media, I, I know that. Um, also, another point is if you are interested in finding out more about spacewalking and what it takes to prepare for a spacewalk, um, Hervé, who we have here today, is actually a guest on the recent um, uh, ESA Explores podcast. So he talks in a bit more depth there about the training process and, and the spacewalks themselves. So that's also a good thing to listen to if you're wanting to find out more information after the fact. Right, so um, let's have a look. Talking of social media questions, I'll go back to some of the questions that came through earlier in the week because um, I've actually been calling for these questions for a little while now in the lead up to this event today. So let's have a look here. What have we got? So um, I know we, we've spoken about the tools. One of the um, questions that we had come through was how long did it take to th develop these tools? Um, and I know I've heard a lot about the one of the major considerations being being sharp edges, um, sharp edges on the tools, sharp edges on the work site. What was done to kind of mitigate this risk? Okay, so um, for the things that we built new, so in the order of 20 new tools were, were constructed for this operation in space, um, obviously we could avoid all sharp edges. Now for the cooling system, the, which is brought up, all edges were inspected several times. Um, okay. The team visited also Aachen uh, in May this year uh, to do an inspection and then before the launch, final inspection was done. So we are sure that we have no sharp edges there. Um, but there are some parts which we cannot unscrew and which we have to break. Uh, carbon fiber covers, so behind this debris shield, debris shield is the first layer. So we have to get deeper inside the experiment and some screws which we need to unscrew, we, we, we cannot reach. So we need to break this carbon fiber cover, the carbon fiber uh, cover for, uh, for a service channel. Um, and there will be sharp edges, yes. And, and I talked to um, the astronauts and asked them, how uh, is this scary, are you worried? And they said, we know exactly where these sharp edges are. Um, and we have trained for it and we will stay away from these sharp edges. Yeah, so we, they know exactly, they seem to know exactly where they move and what they touch and where they have to stay away from. So there are some edges which are dangerous, um, which we cannot avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a risk that is taken into consideration. We, we don't like sharp edges in EVA, but this we know that for these EVAs uh, they will be there. Uh, you might have seen in the uh, flow in the EVA that sometimes in, in the helmet uh, camera you see uh, the gloves of the astronaut and it's currently the astronaut showing the, the surface of the gloves to uh, the ground controllers and also uh, checking if there is in any delta, any, any cut inside and we do it regularly through the EVA and uh, so far the gloves of Luca, despite all this work that he's doing uh, have no delta so they are in good shape. But this is checked regularly. Great. And one other question we had relating to tools was um, we've talked about how they're going to be getting rid of the debris shield, but are they going to be leaving any tools tethered out there for the next time they come out? They're going to be going back and forth to the same workstation or do they bring them with them every time? So there will be, there will be tools that are left outside for the, for the future and they will bring also additional tools in, in, in the future for HEVA. We, we try to go on EVA outside only with the tool that we need, uh, but they anticipate a bit. And uh, of course, as I mentioned before, some of the tools will be thrown away because we don't use them anymore. Perfect, thank you. So I'm just checking in now. We've got one, one final um, piece from Paula. It's um, around the science. Um, so we'll hand over there, see if Paula's around for this final piece of science information. We got you there, Paula. Hand over there, see if Paula's around for this final piece of science information. Hi, Ali. Thank you for uh, giving back <laughs> the line. So, uh, no. can, can, okay. Uh, so we are back on the science. The last subject we are discussing today is AMS and antimatter. And I have first a question for you, Andre. So has antimatter been found and how does it react 
uh, when it touches matter. Uh, we do see anti-matter candidates, candidate events, uh, which uh, look like uh, anti-helium, anti-helium 3 and 4, and we see these events at a very small rates, like one event per year. So in order to make a definitive statement, we do need much more data and to understand uh, our detector to an unprecedented precision of about 10 to the minus 8. Okay, let's now listen to Professor Ting and his take on uh, antimatter and anti-helium, and then we come back here for a last session of Q&A on the fantastic science of AMS. Another fundamental question is the property of antimatter. If the universe comes from Big Bang, the Big Bang origin of the universe will require matter and antimatter to be equally abundant at the very half beginning. Antiprotons, positrons are antimatter, but they are produced from cosmic ray collisions because cosmic ray collisions produce energy, energy can become positrons and antiprotons. But anti-helium, anti-carbon cannot be produced from cosmic ray collision because the mass is so heavy. So people have been looking for anti-helium for a long time and most of the work in accelerators is to find the reason why we do not see antimatter. Next slide, please. And this is an important slide, shows a candidate of heavy antimatter, anti-helium, and shows the charge is minus 205, and the mass is 3.81 plus minus 0.29. The charge is minus. But regular helium, the charge is plus, the mass is the same as the negative one, namely 3.73. This is a signal nobody predicted. Most of people think could not be found. And yet, because of sensitivity of the experiment, we found such totally unexpected signal. Next slide, please. The rate of collecting anti-helium is less than one in 100 million. One in hundred million is a small, it's a very small number. So, anti-helium, it's a very important uh, finding. What's the difference between uh, particles like anti-helium and other particles that you commonly see in cosmic rays, like positrons or anti-muons? Well, anti-helium is extremely difficult to create in the matter environment. It was created in accelerators, but in a tiny quantities. So if uh, such that uh, normal processes, like collision of uh, standard uh, matter particles, they do not produce uh, anti-helium in absorbed quantities. In order to produce uh, those particles which we see, there must be anti-stars or objects like that anti-stars, anti-worlds, anti-us. I think in this question is the right time to say goodbye from CERN today. Uh, keep watching the EVA uh, from any channels, be it NASA or uh, ESA. And uh, I'm Italian, so I want to say Godspeed Luca, and of course also Andrew. Bye-bye <laughs> from CERN, and bye from all of us from the AMS Detector Collaboration. Okay, thank you, Sun. We've got some movement here in the spacewalk. I'll hand over to um, Hervé to tell us a little bit about what's happening with the debris shield now. Yeah, as you can see, the debris shield is a bit loose, so that means uh, all the screws, the fasteners have been removed. Luca is currently attaching uh, the capture block to it and uh, get it ready for being jettisoned in space by Drew. But uh, the main job is done for that. I mean, the cover is released, and that's uh, a good... Uh, it's a good sign for the future work that will be done in the future EVAs. Fantastic.
So that brings us nearly to the end of our coverage here uh, today as well, but it's not the end of the spacewalk coverage. There's still plenty more of that to continue watching, and you can do that via the ESA Web TV stream. You can also keep tuned in to uh, us on Twitter at ESA Spaceflight, um, where we'll be continuing to tell you what's, what's going on, and you can still ask those questions using the hashtag uh, spacewalk for AMS. And of course, don't forget that we do have a series of complex spacewalks, so it's not just today. You can come, you can tune back in, um, and watch the remaining uh, spacewalks that Luca and Drew have ahead of them, and uh, it's only going to get more and more exciting from here. So uh, I, I'll just uh, thank our speakers for their wonderful commentary and their wonderful insights today. It's been great having you here to, to provide that little bit extra to the spacewalk. Um, and, and throughout the day, we will be coming back, uh, Eve and I, at, at crucial points to tell you a little bit more about what's going on and do a bit of a wrap up at the end there. So, um, are there any further comments from our side before we turn over to the, the coverage? Thumbs up. Fantastic. Good work, Luca. Good work, Drew. Keep it up. We'll be watching. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. <laughs>